Welcome back to week two of our series in the Psalms, Under the Sacred Canopy, a pilgrimage through the Psalms. And as Israel said, we'll be looking at Psalm 95 today, which you read responsively with Kristen this morning. Um, I have this peculiar uh, superpower, actually, in which I'm able to wake up in the morning and almost guess the time precisely before looking at the clock. This morning, I woke up, I said it's 6.15, it was 6.12, wow. Sometimes I hit it right on the head. Um, it may not be that super, some of you may be able to do this. Um, and, and there's a reason for that. Um, scientists theorize that you and I have an internal clock. Um, and the, the internal clock that's most studied is something called our circadian rhythms, our body clock. It's quite literally biological. And it's kind of set through those two moments in our day, this rising and the setting of our suns. Our bodies respond to these moments. Our, actually, our organs and our hormones actually speed up and slow down through these and several other moments throughout our day as if we were kind of mechanically in tune. Scientists who study these circadian rhythms use the term Zeitgeber from the German. Zeit being time, Geber meaning giver. And the most powerful Zeitgebers, the most powerful time givers, they say, are dawn and sunset. Daylight being the most powerful zeitgeber, time giver, that resets our biological clock every day. It reinforces and resets our circadian rhythms. Jet lag is not in your head. When you travel any distance where the time changes and the sun comes up at a different time, your body clock gets a little confused from what it's used to. Your body is getting confused, not just your mind. So scientists call this circadian rhythm, this internal clock, our temporal orientation, our orientation to time. And this is time as chronos, the Greek word chronos, simply just the passage of time, the tick-tock. Of course, we invented the tick-tock, we humans, right? The kind of big markers, of course, are sunrise and sunset, but we then divided the day through hours, minutes, and seconds into much finer gradations of time. We invented that because it helps us with, with trade and, uh, and, and meetings and even games, right? How many games have clocks? So we created the kind of man-made time that most of us are obsessed with, right? We're all obsessed with chronos. Uh, we're anxious about wasting time. We're anxious about losing time. We're anxious about filling time. We're anxious about saving time. We're anxious about making up time. These are all words in our vocabulary, right, on a daily basis. And our stress, well, is often related to our relationship to chronos, the tick-tock of the clock throughout the day. And it's chronos that, well, it's a powerfully formative force in our lives. We just kind of go with it. We flow with it. If you control time for someone, well, that's major social formation. You know what doesn't come naturally to us, like Kronos does, is something called divine time. And the Greek word for this is kairos. Kairos is a kind of divine orientation. It's moments of meeting with God, moments of opportunity, Interruptions in chronos, where we sense something greater than just time flowing. Moments of meaning, moments of thanksgiving, moments of wonder that reorients us to the presence of God in time. That's chirotic time, kairos. It's an experience of time lived not just by the clock, but time lived in God. You know, when Jesus offers a definition of eternal time, if you will, in John 17, 3, it has nothing to do with chronos, with tick-tock. He says, eternal life is knowing the only true God 
and Jesus Christ who now is sent. That is Kairos time. Moving through your days with the sense that you are with God, that you know God, that he sees you, that he knows you. But this too has to be indebted deep in our bodies like our circadian rhythms. So if daylight each day, the Zeitgeber, resets and inscribes our temporal orientation, what can reset our divine orientation each day? That's the question. By which I mean, how do we align our bodies, minds, and hearts to live in time with God? Well, this morning I want to offer you Psalm 95 as the spiritual Zeitgeber, the spiritual time giver, the analog to sunrise. If you track it all with the Anglican daily prayers that Israel mentioned uh, earlier, you'll know that the morning psalm is Psalm 95. Our tradition discovered a long time ago, 500 years ago or so, that Psalm 95 will help us in our divine orientation each day. So go ahead, let's take a look at the first three verses. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. The very first word of Psalm 95 in this translation is come. O oh, come. It could just as well be translated walk. O oh, walk. Oh, move. And it suggests what's true, that the first thing that you and I do most days is we move. <laughs> we get up. We move towards something, the bathroom, the coffee maker, the day. At some point, we have to get up and meet the day. We come. We present ourselves. We move. And our days continue to be full of this moving, right? We are presenting ourselves to people all day long, to places, to concerns, to events, to news. And even if you're not moving, man, things are moving toward you. <laughs> the long-recognized metaphor for time is it's a river. And yeah, it's flowing past, but we're in it. And it's flowing into us. Things are coming to us. They're bumping into us. They're going around us. They're kind of going through us. So either we're presenting ourselves to things all day long, or they're presenting themselves to us. Time is a powerful river-like force of presenting things and people and events, news, emotions, fears, presenting themselves to one another. So given the powerful kind of river-like nature of chronos time as we experience it each day, well, the psalmist is going to say, you know, we need to really have a very intentional counter-liturgy, if you will, to, divine, to orient ourselves to divine time. In other words, we need to oh, come to move toward God, to present ourselves to him, if we're going to live in divine time as well. Now, this isn't hard, right? Because God is always right here, right now. To present ourselves to God should be easy, because he's never absent. He's always here. But it takes some intentionality it takes an active imagination, a frequent reframing of the day with what is true in order to live chirotically in divine time. This takes imagination because, you know, the day doesn't just come to us. We imagine the day. We see the day through a certain lens. And to live in chirotic time means we need to see the full reality, even the invisible reality of the day. We need to see the world if we're going to live in it. Or to put it another way, we only live in the world we see. And so we need to imagine each day what is true. The Psalms are such a great help in this. The Psalms are full of imagery. Sight, sound, hearing, smell, and touch. The Psalms are the language of the senses. They speak the language of the body. If sunlight speaks the language of circadian rhythm, the Psalms speak the language of chirotic time. It's why you and I love story, right? Because it involves all the physical stuff. 
of our lives, the people, the places, the food. If you were in Israel's session this morning on Anglicanism, the first, uh, the first seminar, he says one of the features of Anglicanism is we have a sacramental imagination. <laughs> we realize that everything is what it is. People, places, food, nature, rocks, but it also reflects something larger, more invisible. C.S. Lewis's larger, stronger voice. So among the several images in the psalm today, I want to look at two that I think can help us live in divine or chirotic time, and they're these. God is rock, and God is shepherd. God is rock, and God is shepherd. So to begin with, to what or to whom does the psalmist say that we come? Well, in the second line of verse 1, we're given it. We are called to come to the rock of our salvation. Now, for Hebrews, the, sal the word salvation was a broad term. It really covered any situation where God's rescue was needed um, and not limited to the needs we might call spiritual needs. So God's salvation was sought in the Old Testament to save in battle, in shipwreck, in illness, in death, from discouragement. It was sought basically in every place where human capacities were not enough, which if you and I are honest, that's in a lot of places. Any place that you and I were out of our depth, God's rescue God's salvation, is the word, was sought. Where do you feel out of your depth today? Where are your capacities stretched? Come to the rock of your salvation. Now, this is a peculiar rock, it turns out. <laughs> it's not like any rock. Um, now, surely this would be a reference to Mount Zion, on which this temple stood, that rock. But the psalmist goes on in the following verses to actually say, well, you know, this rock, let's call it some, by some other names. Let's call it the great God and king. And this isn't just any god or king, right? The, the ancient world was filled with gods and had several kings. This is not one god vying in a tournament of gods among other gods for the psalmist, any whom might emerge victorious. No, no, we're told in this psalm, this is the king and the god of all other gods, who, of course, are not really gods at all but certainly work that way in people's lives. I was lucky enough recently to be in Rome, and I was reminded that Paul wrote his letter to the Romans. Uh, when he did, there might have been only 50 Christians in the house church, like this many. It was a small church in Rome at that time. You know, the genius of the Roman Empire was that when they captured people, which, right, they kind of conquered the whole known world, basically, they would actually invite all peoples in, and you, they said, basically, you can bring your gods in as long as you worship Caesar above them all. So there are a lot of gods in the Roman Empire. In fact, if you're a first century Christian who receiving Paul's letter, you could walk over to the Pantheon, which you can still do today, which I did. And Pantheon is a large cathedral-looking building in the heart of Rome. And pantheon means all gods. It was a confusing situation. <laughs> a lot of gods had demands on your chronos, depending on where you were from, depending on who your relatives were, depending on what business you were in, you had a god. And in case you forgot, there was also Caesar. And so even when you go to Rome today, you would have seen part of ruins of what the early Christians would have seen, which were huge monuments to Caesar, extremely intimidating. Also a god for the Romans. But the psalmist says, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it, lots of gods. But he says this one, this pre-Roman psalmist says, this one goes all the way back to creation. Verses 4 and 5, in his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. In other words, he made it, he owns it all. He holds it from below and above. He even made and owns the sea, which was the most frightening and unpredictable force in the ancient world. It's where that great deadly fish Leviathan lived that could swallow people whole, right? Talk to Jonah about that. Notice that God is 
creator, but he's not just creator in the sense of an originating event, like he made it all and stepped back and said, good luck. That's what deists think. God made the world and said, good luck. No, to be the creator God in the biblical sense would mean that not only is he the creator of the world, but he is creating the world now. He is sustaining it. The psalm says, in his hands are the depths of the earth. He is the sustaining God in the present tense. If he were to withdraw his breath, we're told in Job, everything would dif- disappear. You know, I sometimes sit on my porch in the backyard and I look out at the trees. We have one tree, but my neighbors have trees. And I see the birds, and I see the clouds, and I see, of course, I see a lot of telephone wires, but I see all those other things. And because I know that God is sustaining everything, I kind of see God. I mean, he's not the same as a tree or a bird, but he is holding all this together. If, if he were to withdraw his breath, this would all vanish. I actually am looking out and going, I see he is holding everything together. He has created, and he is recreating part of how I sense his presence. You're getting the point. To take it historically, God is creator, he is king, and he is recreator. He is recreating. He created it all. He owns it all. Yes, he is over it all. Todd Hunter used to say, God is not nervous about the future. (laughs) We are. (laughs) We are. I am. God owns it all. He created, he's creating, he's recreating. He's not nervous about the future. He holds it, and he holds time. And so, to return to our first image, therefore, he can be for us the rock of our salvation. He can be this peculiar rock that is both is what it is, but transcendental, transcending all that is, imminent, present to all that is. God is the rock, we are not. However, we are, according to Scripture, according to the New Testament, we are united with him through the Holy Spirit. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, 17, we are all baptized by one spirit into one body. He who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. We are united to God. Now, not in the same way the Trinity is. Now, not in the same way the Trinity is. Not in the same way the Son and the Holy Spirit are. But we are united with God. If you have the Holy Spirit with you, if you have received that, if you have consented to that, you are united with God. What remains is for us to live into that truth. We are in union with God. Thomas Oden has observed that the living spiritual union with Christ is not merely cooperation of workers in a common task, or like a union of mind between student and teacher. It's an organic thing, like abiding in the vine, like members of a living body. So while we're not in union with him like the Son and the Spirit are, in our deepest place, because of our union with time, our experience of time can be more like sitting on the rock than Dorothy being tossed around by the weather. You know, what are all the events of each day, right? Think of them. All the thoughts we have, all the opinions we hear, all the media that flows our way, all the circumstances that impact our lives, all the fears we have. Isn't it like so much weather? (laughs) It's just blowing in. It's just blowing through. They roll in, we get rained on, or more appropriate to today, we feel the heat. But here's the good news. We are not the weather. We are not the weather. We are more like the rock. We are not the rock in the way that God is, but we're united to the rock. How's the weather in your life lately? A little stormy? A little foggy? Hard to see the future? A little anxious? Maybe it's calm. What clouds have blown into your life this week? Usually there's something. What's the climate of your life? The good news is we don't have to be the weather. 
we are sitting, standing, lying on the rock, which also gets rained on, it gets sun-baked, but is unchanging. What would it be like to walk through each day with that consciousness, that though vulnerable to the weather, we are more connected to the rock? How would we react to news, to change, to people? to the weather of our own thoughts and feelings that carry us here and there, often miles away from the rock that we're actually united to. Of course, you all know this. It's one thing to know it, and it's another thing to live this way each day in time. Telling you today won't make this true for you. It is something we have to learn with our bodies. Aided by our imagination, imagining what is true, as we imagine each day and awake to find ourselves on the rock, paradoxically the firmest and most comforting of mattresses, if I can be that clever. So the psalmist presents us with this first image, the transcendent rock. He is over all and under all. But then the psalmist shifts to the image of a shepherd. Verses 6 and 7. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. God is shepherd. Sheep are the most frequently mentioned animals in the Bible, 400 times if you count flocks. They're not particularly smart animals. They get lost frequently. And now I quote directly from the Encyclopedia of Biblical Imagery. Sheep are completely dependent on shepherds for protection grazing, watering, shelter, and for tending to injuries. Sheep are not only dependent creatures, they are singularly unintelligent people. Sorry, animals, prone to wandering and unable to find their way to the sheepfold, even if it is within sight. Let that land for a second. Sheep are unable to find their way to the sheepfold, even when it is in sight. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the scriptures, this is our spirit animal. <laughs> You'll, of course, recognize this image from Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We know that this was Jesus' favorite metaphor for himself in his relationship to us. He speaks of my sheep. Where before, of course, we have the God of transcendence, the rock, the kingship, divinity, creator, one that inspires us to worship and pow down. The tone now with God as shepherd is also now nearness and intimacy. Jesus says he calls his sheep by name in John 10, 3. And a few verses later, he says, I call them that they might have life. God is the rock of our salvation. And God is the shepherd of our salvation. How do we live chirotically in Kronos time, according to this? We listen for the voice. We respond to nudges of his staff in our day. We follow where he leads. Like Peter, we look around and say, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. There are things, of course, on my agenda today as in any day, and I trust that I'm being generally obedient with what's on my calendar, right? I've got work, responsibilities, appointment, tasks, aspirations. And we trust that these are the will of God. These are patterns we've established in obedience to our stewardship and our callings and things like this. Gainful employment, caring for families, showing hospitality, washing, cleaning up, managing our lives, and those who depend upon us. But we need to know that as sheep of his hands, we have limited vision. We sometimes can't see what's right in front of us. And so to live chirotically is to live awake, in openness, listening. There may be colleagues today whose suffering is not on my agenda. There is the right thing to do, which turns out not to be on the company's policies. There are moments of wonder and thanksgiving that were not on my calendar. There was a chance to maybe or is a chance to listen to someone else's side in a matter when we had to pl planned on only defending our own. And then there was the dying to self when we had only planned on avoiding pain. 
How do we let the shepherd lead us through the time of day? Well, it's clearly stated in verse 7. Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That's a strange turn in this psalm. It's all been a psalm of orientation, as I may have introduced last week. God is king, God is rock, God is shepherd, all is well, except there's our resistance. Do not harden your hearts. The reference is to the passage we already read, Exodus 17, but also to another one, Numbers 20. In Exodus 17, you'll remember, you just heard that the people are complaining to Moses in the desert that they have no water, and that's understandable. And the Lord instructs Moses to take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile and strike a rock and water will come out. And it's significant that he says the staff, right? Because the staff has worked. <laughs> the staff has always worked, right? It's it, uh, turned into a snake in front of Pharaoh. It um, filled the Nile with blood. It parted the Red Sea. It defeated the Amalekites. The staff worked. And now it brought water from a rock. But in the second passage, which we didn't read today, in Numbers 20, once again, different place on the journey, people are complaining now again of a lack of water. And this time, the Lord comes to Moses and tells him to do something different. He says, I want you to speak to the rock. Not strike it with a staff, speak to it. So what does Moses do? He walks up to the rock, and he strikes it with a staff. <laughs> it's worked before. The Lord says to Moses, because you have not believed me, Read, listen to me. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Kind of harsh. But for the Lord, apparently, listening is extremely important. What was his error? Well, rather than listening to the Lord, he actually trusted a tool, a technique that worked pretty well before, and he just stopped listening. Now, notice in that passage, or if you'd read it, Water still came from the rock. The Lord still allowed the tool to be effective in his mercy. But Moses was no longer fit to lead at this point. I imagine we come to similar places in our journey. In our search for solutions, there's a danger that we'll simply look for what worked before. To the tools, to the techniques. And there is wisdom in experience. Of course there is. But perhaps this temptation to simply go with what's worked before, the techniques, the common wisdom, well, that might be a temptation for us. Yeah, there's a chorus of anxious voices each day calling for us to solve problems, meet urgent needs, secure the present. We feel the pain of others, for sure. We feel the need, and we reach for our staffs. The techniques rather than the relationship. It might be the way we were raised. I was raised that way. It might be good enough for my kids. Might be how the company normally handles its grievances. Well, you know, they're the, they're the bosses. Might be the way we commonly fill our time. Might be the products we use. Well, the warning here is don't stop listening. If you want to live in chirotic time, oh, just keep an open ear. Be ready to feel the nudge. Probably the most things on your calendar are great. Ah, but just stay open. If you want to not just be swept along by Kronos, but if you want to have moments of meeting with God, be open to what C.S. Lewis called that larger, quieter voice. Or what Ezekiel calls the still, small voice. What are your practices each day of staying open? to the voice of God, to listening to the shepherd, to returning to the rock. Well, I still know of no better way in the mornings than to wake up, already awakened by my circadian temporal orientation, but then to present my body to God, which Paul says in Romans 12, 1 is the very definition of worship. I lie on my bed, which is kind of like an altar, shaped such at least, and I present my body to God as a living sacrifice. Say, Lord, here I am. I open the Book of Common Prayer, now that I'm an Anglican. I read Psalm 95. 
And I present myself to the rock, to the shepherd, and to the voice. And yes, if you're hearing it, this is Trinitarian. <laughs> the Father, the Son, and the voice of the Spirit. To see how this day, how he might want to bless me and the people around me in the places I'm in, no matter the weather. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.